Um, okay, so let's move on to our next panel. Um, let me share screen now to show who they all are so I won't forget sharing screen and sharing their awards. So I'm going to announce them first. Uh, don't say anything yet, people, because I'm going to show your award too. So Kimberly Knighty, uh, uh, CETL Director of Technology from North Canton City Schools, will be with us. Dr. Tamara Willis, Superintendent of Susquehanna Township School District in Pennsylvania. Uh, Dr. Paul O'Malley, Superintendent of Pub, um, Butler School District in Illinois. And of course, again, Dr. Uh, Barbara Nesbitt, who's a gainer this year, um, probably much more. Uh, Barbara, Assistant Superintendent for Technology Services, School District of Pickens. So let me show you what we said about them in the awards. And of course, like I've said before, the other award winners, we could have written 36 pages about what we thought about you and how great you are, um, but we kept it like short and sweet um, so that you can put it up on a wall when you uh, print it out and frame it. Um, North, North Canton um, awarded for digital choice in learning fully online or in-person learning. Um, plus an advanced technical architecture and consistent UI UX for parents and students. This is a really big achievement for kind of a smaller district, uh, you know, a suburban of 4,200 students. Uh, you probably have a lot of other programs there, and I know, I know you're going to talk about that. Um, <clears throat> Susquehanna, super proud, awarded for uh, leadership returning the district to a new normal with attention on technology enablement inclusive of customized learning and a social emotional address that we think is probably one of the best in the nation um again for a smaller district this is some this is some heavy lift so i'm super proud of them um and then um butler uh, awarded for visionary leadership through digital transition with both core and supplemental initiatives to support learning and expose students to new skills um, powerful, again, for a smaller district. Um, and then, you know, larger district, but school district of, of Pickens, did I, I think we got the number of your students right. Look at yes. your sophistication. Yeah, with your digital, we didn't put very many of these kind of slides in here, but this was, this was a screen grab of your digital ecosystem. Um, awarded for authentic career tech education, leadership with global interoperable standards, a robust digital ecosystem, your altered schedules and models. That's huge. I mean, I can't stress that enough. And empowering learners with maker spaces. Um, this is a this also really heavy lift. Um, I want to just go back uh, to you guys as panelists, um, introduce you each individually and have you start talking about kind of, you know, your first, um, you know, what are your biggest wins in the last year? I'm going to have that be the first round of questions as you introduce yourselves to our audience. Kimberly, you're first on the slide. I'm gonna have you go first. Okay, uh, I'm Kim Knighty. I'm, uh, and I'm now the Director of Technology at North Canton City Schools. Uh, I was a business and technology teacher here for many years and then came down into the district office to serve as an innovation specialist at first. And then I was director of instruction for like two years, and now I'm serving as director of technology. So I've been here a really long time, <laughs> and I've seen us progress. I'm very proud of um, the things that we do here in North Canton. Um, but I think I, I, I'm trying to think how to phrase. Um, so the past year, it's just been a lot. We all share in this, so I can say it or anyone else on the panel or anyone else listening what we've all been through. It's been a shared experience for sure. Uh, and we know there's been a lot of negatives that have come from it, but I've tried to focus on the positives and I've seen a lot. Um, I've seen, uh, I keep calling it and people laugh at this, but I've seen a lot of our teachers who were maybe a little reluctant kind of get pushed off the digital cliff a little bit. Um, so <laughs> we've had Schoology in our district for like eight years. And I, while I had a lot of super users, I had some people who were still a little reluctant to jump in and they ended up finding out how useful an, an LMS can be. Um, we also had a one-to-one -one in place for that amount of time. So we were very lucky. But again, it really kind of framed it in a different light. Um, and so they they grew. I mean, even our, our top performers grew kind of like our kids, right? Our staff did the same thing. They all grew at, at different rates, but every, everybody kind of evolved and, and grew together. And someone would learn a new thing that they were doing and then it would spread like wildfire. They would teach um, everybody else. And so that it's been kind of fun to just see how far we've come in a short amount of time um, compared to 
you know, maybe the last eight years. Uh, and I look yeah. forward to where we go next. The conversations are open for sure. Yeah, I love the way you characterize it. You're sort of inching along before and now and then everyone fell off a cliff, which is which is what happened, right? So yeah. Um, Kim, that's awesome. All right. So uh Dr. Tamara Willis, superintendent of Susquehanna, let's give you have you a little time to give us a little intro and what happened. Well, hello everyone. Uh Tamara Willis, superintendent. Um, I've been with the district um for about seven years now, I was uh, the assistant superintendent for curriculum and instruction for about two years, and I just entered my fifth year. I'm in the lot. As superintendent. Lot. Hey, and so, um, it's been an exciting time. Um, as I'm sure, as Kim said, we've all kind of experienced the same uh, 19 months or so uh, during this pandemic. But I would say one of the, the biggest shifts and changes that we've experienced in our district was really. Um, an intensification, I would say an intensifying of the partnership that we've shared with our teachers. Um, our teachers Mary really Mary rallied Jane. around um, us and um, no. during the pandemic no. from the moment we closed our schools in May of 20, in March of 2020, uh, we were on the phone with our teachers, our teacher leaders, and we started problem solving together. Okay. And that has really allowed us to uh, move through this pandemic. I just want a latte. That's all I really want. Um, hold, hold, yes. hold on just okay. a second, Tamara. We, and we I'm still, still have on Tim, call. Tim, Tim not on mute. Tim, you got to mute yourself. Sorry. Sorry, Tamara. We're that's getting okay. back channel chatter. We're like, okay. Yeah. So, Doug, can you make sure anybody that's not speaking is muted? Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So, Tamara, go ahead. No, no problem. That's also been a part of our existence for the last yeah. 19 months. <laughs> Yeah, um, we all know the word mute now, don't we? Yes, <laughs> we know. Um, but yeah, so we partnered with our teachers from day one um, to help solve the challenge and address the challenge that was before all of us. And I will say that our teachers really rose to meet that challenge. Um, they helped us craft our solution from day one. Um, they helped us develop the professional development that they needed. And so as we talk about customizing learning for students, we also found that we needed to customize our professional development for the adults because they did not all come um, to this space with the same experiences. One of the things that was actually surprising was that um, some of our more seasoned teachers embraced the change more readily than our newcomers, right? So sometimes you would assume that those folks who are recent graduates would embrace the technology. And that was not always the case, but we took folks where, from where they were. And then um, now that we're all back fully face-to-face, -face, uh, we've also relied very heavily on our teachers to let us know what our students need from the social and emotional side. Um, what are you seeing? What are the changes in student behavior um, that you observe since our students have been back uh, full-time? And there are some real challenges there. We are reteaching some things that, you know, we assumed, I, I don't want to say we assumed, we had forgotten that students just did not come to school with these things. Um, so for example, our current first graders, they did not have the luxury of that kindergarten experience. And so they're coming to school needing to learn all of the social norms that they would have learned in kindergarten, right? On top of that, though, we're layering this new use of technology. Um, and so the learning curve is still very steep for everyone, but because we are truly partnering with our staff, it's making our progress so much easier. Um, so that was a huge takeaway for us. That's awesome, awesome. And I for, I keep forgetting that about the kindergartners. They're all, they're all arriving basically, at, you know, first graders now. Yes, the first time. It's like this is wild. Um, thank you for that. Okay, so uh, Dr. Paul O'Malley from from Butler School District, why don't you go ahead and give us your intro? So I'm Dr. Paul O'Malley. Paul O'Malley, just call me Paul. Um, um, we are in the community of Butler, which is in Oak Brook, Illinois. Very small district, very personalized district, very familial district, and our district is comprised of a lot of doctors and nurses and attorneys. And we had a theme, our narrative going into the year that really has continued through this point in time is, 
we want to maintain the unity and community. And the reason we chose to go with a theme or a narrative was because we were seeing that, especially in the state of Illinois, there was a lot of division. There was a lot of division in the communities. There was a lot of really just differences of opinion. And even in our district, we started with a 60-40 split. 60% wanted to be in person, 40% was remote. And we developed with our teachers, with our coaches, a, a in parallel model where the kids at home could learn in a safe environment at the same extent to the students that were in school. And it was very tough. I could tell you our teachers were real troopers, real winners. They just really set an unprecedented cadence that very few people could keep up with, especially in a state where we saw such a high incident rate, in a county, a high incident rate of cases. And it took us really over the course of a year to really build that trust over and over and over to really to the point to where our teachers felt really really safe and they felt like they could come in an environment and really just continue to just persevere and um in addition we uh, we created our own health service model we we had testing in place uh prior to many other schools and we gave it free to not only the teachers not only the students not only the families, but our, our workers and their family members. And so we've continued to, to go forward and really to persevere to the point where we were ex actually recognized for the National Blue Ribbon Award at Butler Junior High. And it was just a great milestone for us to receive that recognition. And we just continue to just really build that climate and culture. And to your point, uh, I think they were speaking about this at the previous meeting about the SEL. There's a lot of TLC that goes into continuing forward because I got to tell you, it's not easy out there. When, you, when you're hearing in the news that there's another variant and another variant and another variant, it could wear very easily on your staff. And so we've shifted the mindset. We're more for the, uh, the TLC, the SEL, and really finding ways to extend upon our practices to have people come back into the buildings, to have all of our activities brought back into the buildings, and it's just been phenomenal to say the least. And, and I gotta share with you, we could not have done it without the teachers really standing strong and persevering. We could not have done it without the coaches that we put in place, uh, very strong individuals. And we really integrated technology that would really put Elon Musk to shame. And, and it, that's some of the things that have really continued to, to really put us in a position to be successful. We're continuing to move forward with that same mindset and and it's not over it's not over there's a lot of opportunities that we're going to expand upon and these improvements are going to come in the form of of having more digitization of our, our curriculum and we're looking forward to just more greatness and more positivity i love that i love that you know i ha i'm having a really joyful day talking to all of you winners today i'm just bubbling over inside it's so awesome all right so um Barbara, if people were on in the last hour, they, they've heard a little bit, but why don't you do another quick summary overall um, of what, what's happened for you in the last year with Pickens? Oh, I, you know, I think some of our biggest win, if I have to go back and look at it, centers around culture more than anything. Our superintendent, just like um, Dr. O'Malley was saying, was just passionate that we would put people first no matter how hard it was. And so we were able within a few days, believe it or not, to get everybody some device that they could use, even if it was an older device. And we had a small monitor that they could take home so if they were data entry secretary, whatever, so that we could honor the dignity of work and letting people be able to work from home during that time. And then we had people that, you know, were serving, delivering but food on buses and helping, you know, do do um put meals together and packages of food and we, we were real proud that we allowed a, an enormous amount of flexibility so that people felt safe and we could do the best we could for kids. And I'd say we, have, we are trying to continue that while also trying to focus on the learning gaps that have been cre created and exasperated by COVID. And so how do we keep addressing those? And I think one of the other things that, that we're real proud of is that one of the blessings of COVID, an unintended positive, has been that choice is now um, is even more impactful. There are more choices for kids than there were before. So we wanted to do a virtual school 
And that was on the roadmap, and now we have it because we were forced to have it because of COVID. And we have kept that virtual school. And we have about 4% of our families who've stayed in the virtual school. We think probably that's going to be an ongoing, an ongoing practice. So if you want to be fully click, you can, K through 12th grade. Um, if you want to be fully brick, you can. And if you want to have choices of brick and click, we offer that as well. So we're, I think we're real proud that we have that we have taken advantage of a lot of the opportunities of COVID to offer more choices. Um, we've worked on expanding broadband to the home. I, I, I could talk about that as well. But you did met, you did mention that we we revamped our schedules a lot last year, and we've continued to revamp them this year so that we could have smaller cohorts safely stay in school as much as we can. And between about 78% for our high school kids and about 86% for our youngest kids and our special needs kids, we were open in the 2021 school year. And so, and and we were able to keep our cases low and to keep, keep people safe, as safe as you know we can, trying to balance health and the need for kids to be present in school because some of them did not come from homes where their parents could keep them all day. I mean, in some cases where they really shouldn't have been all day, you know, anyway, for, for different reasons. So those are some of the things I think we're probably most proud of uh, uh, in all of this. We've we've done an awful lot to enhance social and emotional um, needs for both students and adults. One of the things we've done is put in a lot of technologies which we use securely as our filter. We've put an auditor to monitor all the Google Drives and emails, but we also have purchased the 24 program so that somebody else is monitoring all of these alerts and not our principals, and that they're able to look live. People who are trained and skilled can look at some of these alerts and go in to see what kids are actually searching for and only execute a call to an administrator when they need to. That's been tremendously helpful for our administrators who want to make sure kids are safe um, we're dealing with a lot of issues, as, as I'm sure my peers are on this call and on the web, the, the whole meet of kids, kids who are dealing with a lot of emotional issues from having been out and dealing with COVID and been away from school and just relearning how to get along and play nice with others. And I mean, we're dealing with all of that. And the last thing I think we've done that has helped our adults is we have purchased an employee assistance program that all of our adults, every employee and every family member has access to free counseling of any kind, whether it's marriage counseling, you know, anxiety counseling, um, free will creation, financial advising, and we have purchased this for every family member, for every employee in the district so that there is no excuse there's no financial reason why you can't reach out to get the help that you need. So, oh, that's really that holistic. I think it's the first time I've heard that one. That's awesome. I'm proud of you for doing that. Thank you. Um, all right, so let's let's have another round here, and I'm going to go back to um, what each of you guys have talked about a little bit, and 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 since none of you are like super urbans. You know, where it's like mm -hmm. physically not really usually that far to get your school. You're probably all four of you dealing more with the alteration of space and time um, because you're not concentratedly urban um, than the urbans are. And it's probably not going to go away that you have this disparate map of physicality versus, you know, remote. So I want to have you sort of go through and talk about maybe a, some more detail of what you saw happen, but also kind of what you're thinking for the future, because uh, the distortion of space and time we don't think is really going to go away, and the data is showing that. Um, so going back another round, I'm going to start with you, uh, Kim Knighty, and have you make your comments on that. Uh, yeah, so we... Um, trying to think like um, what would be good examples for you. <laughs> um, so we we were pretty much in person the whole. I mean, other than when we went remote, uh, when we all went remote, kind of in that springtime. When we came back, we were predominantly in person. Um, so we were our district was really unique in that uh, there were a lot of districts in Ohio that 
uh, stayed remote or had a very big, you know, split between who was in school and who wasn't. We probably had about 10% of our kids who stayed digital. And we had, we already had a digital academy that was kind of set up to serve that. So we had uh, kids in there. What we did learn from that and what I think everybody's kind of learned. I remember when teachers were afraid of online learning because they always viewed it as they want to replace me. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping anyway that our staff really got to see that that is not the case. I mean, we learned very quickly that if you have just uh, an online learning system set up without teacher intervention, that is not the best way, you know, for kids to learn for a lot of reasons, right? So we started uh, to, um, we put a lot of our teachers then around those kids that were in the digital learning. So they were using the system, but we were using our LMS to wrap content around what they were doing in that online learning system. So in that respect, that space and time, I mean, I think that was a lesson learned that now I really feel like we want to, to kind of come forward with, because I think we learned that for some kids, pandemic or not, um, this is the best way for them to learn, is maybe just not being in the quote unquote traditional classroom. So while we had an option set up for some kiddos um, already, we really, learned that it could be more than what it was and so we are having those conversations around how do we make that learning um you know how do we how do we create content around you know a if we use a learning system uh, how do we create content around that and have those teachers involved to give that you know space as an option and um, that's where we had a lot of teachers that created Bitmoji classrooms because we were yeah. using Schoology and so they created yeah. Bitmoji classrooms and my gosh, that's the other thing we found out that is whether you're, whether you're at home or whether you're in school, whether maybe you're in school but you're home on quarantine, whatever that space looks like. Uh, it's the teachers decided, my gosh, what a great way to connect with my students and my, my families. So that has kind of driven us forward and in there they're addressing social emotional. So like one day it would be a non-learning day. Today we're gonna do games and activities and ways to celebrate each other in the classroom and feel that connection even though we may physically not be together. Um, so they, they learned, it was interesting how many lessons they learned about how they could take this forward. Um, we let our high school kids uh, take an option to have lunch off campus, that was, like huge. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. they did that in the 80s when I was in school, but <laughs> it hasn't been done since then. So I think they learned, hey, you know, maybe this is okay. Kids do come back. <laughs> I think they were all afraid of what's going to happen when they leave. Where are they going to go? What are they going to do? Are they going to come back on time? And I think that they found out, yeah, you know, they, they really will. They probably are going to go home and they're going to make a grilled cheese sandwich and, you know, then they're going to head back. So uh, I just, think that some of the barriers that were up or like time of day, um, we're still looking at, you know, some schools around here went to block scheduling, all these things that we've kind of sat around and said, man, this would be great. We should try this, but you're almost paralyzed to, to do it because um, you're afraid of what the outcome will be, that those barriers started to come down. And so while I don't know that in our district, we had a, a large shift, we had smaller shifts that I think are, are continuing, are morphing, and I hope to see us, you know, kind of break down more of those barriers um, as we move forward and give kids really more opportunities, you know, to learn we, we, um, in different ways, you know, instead of just the, the traditional. I love the um, brick and click idea, so uh, that's a great way to kind of to look at that as well. So we're uh, engaging with our Department of Education as well, our Ohio ODE, they're looking at creating a framework for personalized learning. Like there's just so many things that are now coming from this that I think are going to allow us to make those changes moving forward. So that's what's yeah, up with I us. Yeah, I love everything that you just said. And, I, and it, makes, it makes me realize, even if all you had as the biggest takeaway was the, <clears throat> the fact that some kids learn better in a different situation, um, this is the first sort of line into um, the systemic inequity that is the structure itself. Because you can talk about inequity every day of the week, but until you look at it as a structural thing, like everyone had to be the same moving along the manufacturing line, <clears throat> that's never been the human condition. 
Like we're not all alike, period. Mm -hmm. You can be from the exact same family and all your kids are totally different, right? So mm -hmm. let's just acknowledge that fact. So that's my big takeaway, Kim, of everything that you just said is you guys learn maybe not really huge time and space alteration, but you learn that, which is great. Well, um, and I'd add, I'm sorry, just I wanted to add one thing too that we learned was, okay, why do we let a student be in a class and experience failure before we're willing to step in and move them to a digital yeah. environment? You know, I mean, I think in some cases we have been, we, we've been reactive instead of proactive. And I feel like that's a big shift that, that is happening now too, so. Yeah, that's huge. Um, okay, so I just got a, a hand signal on my time and I'm like, I thought we had an hour with you guys and we don't have a whole hour. We only have five more minutes. So I'm gonna ask each of the other three to like get all your thoughts in order and let's go faster. Um, so your answers on this whole shift thing, uh, Dr. Willis, I know you already put one comment in, but what is your what is your comment on this? So the shift for us, um, I, I, Kim, it's great going after you. Like you have these wonderful answers. I could just say ditto. Um, what I would add uh, is that we we did something very similar. Um, we actually had a number of families who had health related reasons for not wanting to return to the in person to in person learning. We never closed our doors, by the way, either. Uh, we were able to adopt a, um, a, synchron an a synchronous model that allowed students to learn alongside their in-person peers from home, right? And so uh, we, we recognized very, re very quickly that students' um, needs had to come first. The needs of the families had to come first. And so we had families saying to us, my grandmother lives with us, my mother lives with us, we cannot afford to expose them but I want my student, my child to learn. And so we very quickly had to pivot. I know that is like the word of the, the year. Uh, we had to pivot to make sure that those students were not missing out because they could not return to the brick and mortar. And so our team, not only our curriculum team and our technology uh, team, but also um, our human services team. So our social workers, our counselors, they all had to develop a way to touch these students every day, just as they would if they were in the classroom. And so we provided a lot of virtual counseling. Uh, we provided yep. a lot of uh, all our IEP meetings were all of, were, were virtual. Everything that we offered for in-person students, we found a way to offer it virtually. To include awesome. speech. At first we thought, we can't provide speech virtually. We did it. Um, and I think, again, uh, I believe um, uh, someone said it earlier, Paul, you said it earlier, it has to be humans first. We have to look at the people first. And school will pivot to make sure that those needs are met. And that's what we did. And that's what we're committed love to it. doing even beyond the pandemic. Yeah, love it, love it. Okay, final comments. Also, Dr. O'Malley. You know, I can, the one thing I can tell you is, is for the first time ever, the, the best practice was challenged. And you're gonna see the emergence of many new practices. And, and I believe that was brought up by Barb. And I think that's the strongest statement that we have here today, in my opinion. And I think there's going to be some great opportunities that that people will need to capitalize on. But I think it starts with the strategic abandonment. What are we doing that we no longer need to do that we continue to do because that's what we do. And that becomes problematic because it's layer over layer over layer of, of not necessarily a, a, a cake, a wedding cake, but more like a fruit cake. And I don't know about you, but those are not necessarily as popular. They're blended and they give basically, <laughs> you know, don't give the taste that we're looking for. And so for us, we want to basically put together something that's layered, that's something we can celebrate, that's going to withstand the test of times and, and is going to be something that is really, really unique. And, you know, I'm looking forward to that. I think I think those are the two things that I would, I would walk away from. And uh, the last thing I would say, it's 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 process over the answer. You know, you have to develop processes that can withstand the test of time. And as I've said, and I've said this before, you can ask Siri for the answer anytime you want. You can ask Alexa for the answer anytime you want. Uh, it's the process of getting to the answer that that I think has come forward more than ever before. And that's where we're going to have to individualize that learning so that 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 student becomes the beacon of what they believe is best for them as they really determine their futures. Yeah, love that. Love that whole thing that you just said. Awesome. Okay, so um, uh, Dr. Nesbitt, your final All right, 
I, I'll be quick, but I will say that just one of my passions is removing a barrier that's created by rurality and poverty, and that's lack of broadband access at home. And oh, so for oh. many students, if we're going to remove barriers of space and time to enable what all of my colleagues said, which I so agree with, which is more flexibility. We've already taken down so many barriers when it comes to thinking that we have to do things the way we've always done it. And I love what Paul just said and the others. Um, but for some of these kids, they can't do that and can't access the opportunities because they don't have broadband at home. And mm -hmm. so we can give kids devices, but even still, if you're in rural South Carolina in the mountains, your hotspot may not work. And it may not be enough for a family of four, especially if your mom also wants to get on and practice for the GED or apply for jobs. We have got to address broadband in America. And I think that um, ECF is doing that with the E-rate Money Emergency Connectivity Fund. The infrastructure bill is doing this. Lots of local state governments are. Um, sometime I'd love to share the story of some of the things that we've done to remove those barriers for Pickens County. But our goal is for 100% of residents in Pickens County to have access to high speed, high quality internet. It's going to help with telehealth. The barriers are removed for that as well. It's going to help with telework where the barriers have been removed for that. And it's gonna help with, with being able to learn anywhere, anytime and giving kids opportunities, not just based on your zip code, but regardless of your income level, regardless of whether you live in the mountains and you're five miles from the nearest city, you don't have access to broadband, even if your parents could afford it. We've got to address yeah, yeah. broadband as an issue. It's a barrier. Yeah, I, yeah. I believe it's a human right. I, I believe it's a universal human right. And our government needs to act federally. Um, totally Great. agree with you. Well, thank mm -hmm. you guys all so very much. You're all super awesome. Um, you can download the document that has your individual cert in there, but you will be getting packages from us you know, of the little digital elements you can stick everywhere and share with everyone. But thank you guys both for all of you for being super awesome. And uh, we'll see you next time. Stay on if you want.